Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks, Richard, for coming along uh, to uh, do this interview for the uh, Nuclear Medicine Molecular Medicine podcast. We're in uh, Santiago at the uh, 2016 uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting, and since we last met, a lot of things have happened. Um, yes, that's true. And uh, um, I, I noticed that you published a paper recently on dealing with prostate cancer, which is one of the most common and most difficult to manage cancers. Um, that we have. Um, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about where you are and, and what you do and tell us a little bit about the paper that you uh, just published. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Richard Baum. I'm the chairman of the Theranostic Center uh, and uh, the clinical director of the Department of Molecular Radiotherapy at Zentralklinik in Bad Berka in Germany. And uh, we started actually working uh, with radio-labeled peptides for diagnosis and treatment of neuroendocrine tumors uh, long ago, 20 yes. years ago, in 97. Yes. yes. And uh, we organized the first World Congress on Theranostics in 2011 in Bad Berka, in my uh, center, with uh, 400 participants from 56 countries, which uh, at that time demonstrated for the first time, I think, the real interest in theranostics. Yes. So in using peptides, you know, to predict if a therapy really can work in a patient. Yes. And in neuroendocrine tumors, um, there is meanwhile, as you know, this uh, prospective clinical trial, the NETA-1 yes. study finished, uh, which has really proven that this concept of uh, treating tumors with radio-labeled peptides is superior to conventional treatment. Yes, yes. So there is a longer progression-free survival uh, and there will be also, I'm sure, uh, a better overall survival. So in 2013, actually, uh, we took this experience uh, from neuroendocrine tumors to prostate cancer. And that was possible uh, because of a collaboration between our center and the Technical University of Munich with Professor Wester's group who produced a PSMA, a Prostate Specific Membrane Antigen, uh, which is actually an enzyme uh, which is present in prostate cancer cells. It's a transmembrane enzyme um, which can be targeted by certain ligands and we can uh, label these ligands with gallium-68 yes. for diagnosis and we started with that um, already um, in 2012 and it was really uh, amazing yes. because uh, PSMA is highly expressed in this prostate cancer and um, it allows to detect very small metastases right. down to a size of two, three millimeters, wow. something we were dreaming about 10 wow. years ago. And uh, very hard to pick up prostate cancer because it's so slow growing that it, uh, FDG and other, other imaging methods like MRI just don't pick it up, up at all, in terms yeah. of, or hardly ever pick it up at all in terms, until the prostate's well spread. Yeah, and the, the role is not so much in the primary diagnosis where MRI, you know, still is a imaging modality of choice, maybe in combination also with uh, PSMA, so one can do PET MRI using gallium-68. Um, PSMA, like the group again in Munich, has uh, shown and published. But what is more important is the you know, uh, recurrent right. tumor. And these tumors are usually treated by hormones. Yes. So uh, ADT or androgen uh, Deprivative uh, therapy, right? Okay, and um, that leads uh, in nearly all the cases to a response uh, to the treatment, but only for some time. Right. So after two, three, four years, uh, this uh, metastasis is tumors recur and start to grow again, and that's where we come in right. because PSMA is mostly expressed in far advanced in undifferentiated tumors and uh, it allows as I said to image these metastases in lymph nodes but also in lung in liver and in bones right. where they are most frequent 
and uh, then we can take the same small ligand and label it uh, with the tissue 177, right. which is a better emitter. Right, and it's also, you've used it previously in other therapies. Yes, and we have performed uh, approximately 5,000 peptide therapies uh, in neuroendocrine tumors with uh, lutetium more than 3,600. And uh, so we could use our experience from the past. Uh, and uh, we started in 2013 to treat prostate cancer. And uh, meanwhile, we have uh, done approximately 150 patients. Yes. I think it's the largest series uh, in the world. Um, with very advanced disease. So wow. This is not only what we call castrate or castration resistant prostate cancer, but these uh, cancers are also resistant to chemotherapy. Right. Or the patient had received operation, hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, and also what we call the new drugs, uh, you know, like uh, abiraterone and salutamide which are um, more effective hormone blockers, yes. but still the disease is then progressing. Wow. So we were really last line. And you asked for the paper, so the paper we have published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, uh, which uh, is online since January um, this year, uh, was a group of patients with far advanced disease. So treatment last line after all the uh, you know, therapies I just mentioned. Well, prostate and cancer in numbers is one of the biggest killers of all cancers. Ab absolutely, yeah. It yeah. is uh, one of the most frequent cancers around the world. So there are differences, uh, actually, uh, in the southern and uh, uh, northern hemisphere. There are differences in incidences, but in men it's definitely one of the greatest killer. And um, if there is no uh, treat, there is no treatment after chemotherapy and the new drugs. Okay. Yeah. So this is a new opportunity and uh, despite this last time therapy we were very successful. How successful were you? Actually we saw a response in more than 80% of wow. the patients. And these are people that had failed everything else? They have failed everything else and um, we had a progression free survival which is really amazing. Uh, of around 13.7 months, okay? Right. So, and the overall survival was not reached after this uh, observation period. So, um, this is, uh, you know, something where chemotherapy offers a survival benefit of just two or three months. Right. Uh, we had a progression-free survival uh, of about one year or longer. Wow, that's which a is dramatic. In the, in the worst possible situation. In the worst possible situation. And it's not only prolonging life. I mean, what is for me, I'm still, uh, you know, working a lot with patients in, in, the, in the hospital. I'm a real clinician, not yes. only doing research. And seeing these people, you know, people coming in in a wheelchair uh, because they had so extensive bone metastases and pain. Yes. And yes. then after one single course of treatment, they came with their own car and walking. Wow. And you know the pain, pain reduced uh, quality of life. The yes. quality of life uh, improved dramatically. So I think this is um, one of the biggest chances uh, actually nuclear medicine has for the coming ten years, right. because in in my feeling, um, it will be uh, probably the most important therapy for nuclear medicine uh, after radioiodine therapy, yes. which by this way. Uh, this year has a 75th anniversary yes, yes. of uh, starting radioiodine therapy in patients. Right. So um, you found with the other theranostics that, that, that they worked very well in, in very difficult to treat cases, but then gradually you started to use it uh, earlier and earlier in the process and you got even better yes. results. Do you think the same thing might happen with prostate cancer? I'm absolutely sure. We have meanwhile treated also patients not in last line, yes. so after failing all therapy, but also in an in a earlier situation. These were interestingly all medical doctors yes. uh, who, ah. refu who refused chemotherapy. You know, medical doctors with prostate cancer. Right. So they said, no, I do not want chemotherapy 
because you know an advantage of two or three months it's not uh, worth it it's not worth it yeah, yes if, if you look at the possible adverse effects and so on so, so I said no I do not want chemotherapy or there were some patients who could not tolerate chemotherapy right. due to other conditions and uh, the response uh, is even better in this earlier patient group. Okay? Right. So um, for the future, um, one has to think how to put this therapy in which order, and I'm sure it will be come from last line, uh, maybe not first line, because hormonal therapy is still very effective and has not so you know, huge side effects. Right, and there is a group of prostate cancers that, that are so slow growing that, yeah. that it's not, treatment uh, with other than hormone therapy is probably not indicated. That you are be... completely right. I mean, prostate cancer is not a single cancer type. Right. It's a very heterogeneous disease where we have very aggressive tumors, yes. okay, which kill patients um, actually within months. You know, uh, I call them the Sapa cancer, you know Frank Sapa, yeah. the famous uh, yes. rock musician yes, yes. who died also of prostate cancer in a young age. Right. So these are young aged uh, patients, you know, with very aggressive uh, tumors. And there is um, this more slowly growing, very benign behavior in old patients. You right. know? And um, I think one really has to differentiate uh, and find in future you know, more indicators, which is a more aggressive form of disease right. and which is a more right. benign behavior. And PSMA is expressed mainly in this very aggressive tumor types. I mean, one of the issues though, I mean, you've had very successful therapy with the other Theranostics, but you've had difficulty getting it into the US, for example. I mean, um, the, uh, if you like, the Steve Jobs cancers, if you like, you had the, yeah, had that, yeah. we, I mean, people really would have benefited from that. Let's hope we don't have the same long span in getting things into the US like we've had. I'm before. absolutely sure that uh, in prostate cancer it will be much faster. Right. You know, I had a lot of contacts uh, to industry here at the Congress in San Diego, and um, there, there are many companies really interested in planning already now clinical trials in, in prostate cancer with lutetium PSMA. Right. So uh, it took us uh, actually uh, more than 20 years from the first therapy which was uh, performed in, in Basel in 96 with yttrium 90 Dota yes. uh, and later on in Rotterdam with lutetium Dota Tate to the NETA-1 trial. Yes, it took yes, about yes. 20 years actually. It took quicker than yeah. yes. Yeah, and um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure with PSMA, because it's of course also a very attractive market for industry, Yes, uh, it will uh, you know, start maybe end of the year or beginning of next year. I know of plans starting a you know, prospective trial in Germany, especially, but there are also um, a lot of companies you know, uh, thinking about uh, using it. Um, at the last line, but probably also uh, at the previous previous time point, uh, you know, uh, to treat uh, metastatic prostate right. cancer. You're changing the world. Oh, I hope so very much. Yeah. Right. No, and, no, you uh, are. I mean, we're dealing yeah. with, you know, uh, almost the most common cancer. Probably breast cancer is more still more common, but but but, but certainly the most difficult to treat cancer in terms of common cancers. And this will change the world. I mean, it will make the world a better place for most families. I think uh, what is really most important is that it will change the life of many patients, you know, yes. to the better. Yes. And uh, as I mentioned, reduce pain, yes. uh, reduce symptoms uh, in advanced diseases. And that's very satisfying to see that you can offer a new kind of therapy and Theranostics is so fascinating because you can immediately show to the patient and to your uh, colleagues, you know, that the therapy will work. Yes. We see what we treat. Yes. And that's, uh, I think, a big difference to chemotherapy. Yes. Where you uh, throw something in a black tunnel. And you, you might know, get a blood test or something, but you yeah, can't really see where, where it is and how it's working. And uh, of course it works in many patients, but it also fails in many patients. Yes. And for the individual patient, uh, 
you never know is this a patient who will respond uh, very good to chemotherapy or is this a patient who will not respond to chemotherapy. And that is, uh, I think, the advantage of theranostics that we can in some way predict you know, that therapy will work and that there will be a response. Right. Now, uh, how, there's, a, there's, a, there's another meeting coming up in the theranostics meeting. Uh, yes. Uh, actually in your home country yes. uh, and in your home city in yes. Melbourne. Yes, that's right. Uh, in November uh, we will have the fourth Serenostics World Congress. So as I mentioned, the first took place in our center in, in Germany in Bad Burka. The second one was in, uh, in India. Uh, the third one in the United States uh, in collaboration with Johns Hopkins University. And this is now the fourth one. And there's new cancers um, being looked at at this meeting, isn't there? Yes, definitely. Rod Hicks will be the president, right. uh, of the Congress president, and Michael Hoffman, the scientific secretary, uh, together with me. And uh, it will be, a, I'm sure, a fascinating Congress. We have very good speakers, you know, very renowned uh, speakers, and uh, a lot of new topics. You know. Not only gallium 68, but probably copper? also other labels, copper 64, F18 for labeling of peptides. So it's a completely new world opening. Excellent. Well, so I'll see you there. Thank okay. you very much for okay. helping us out. Okay, see you. Yes. <laughs> Good.